why General Milley and the top military brass need to resign, not just for the botched withdrawal plan, for lying to us about Afghanistan for 20 years. Also, here come the Afghans. I'm talking about hordes of refugees. Debbie and I are going to have a candid conversation about that. And Trump attorney Jenna Ellis joins me to talk about current issues and her new podcast. This is the Dinesh D'Souza podcast. America needs this voice. The times are crazy. In a time of confusion, division, and lies, we need a brave voice of reason, understanding, and truth. This is the Dinesh D'Souza Podcast. The focus on Afghanistan right now has been and is on getting the Americans out. And there remain many thousand Americans still in Afghanistan. There's complete chaos about what is being done to get them out. Uh, The State Department says, um, don't go to the airport, we'll contact you. The Pentagon says, oh, you can go to the airport, we'll try to get you out. And the Taliban has just issued a statement basically saying, if these guys are not out by um, August 31st, uh, we're not extending the deadline. You're on your own after that. So the Taliban is calling the shots. It's kind of eerie to watch um, the pleading attitude of the Biden people who are conceding that the Taliban, and not they, are in charge. Think of it, in charge of thousands of American lives. So this was a horrible operation from start to finish on the part of Biden. And he's being rightly excoriated for it. In fact, I haven't seen so much chastisement of Biden in the mainstream media as we are, as we are seeing on this issue now. But The broader issue here is that the Pentagon, our top generals, have been lying to us about Afghanistan for 20 years, with uh, General Mark Milley kind of at the top of this chain uh, of dishonesty. Now, um, uh, Milley, just recently, this is July 21st, this was his uh, press conference where he says, I'm not quoting him, the Afghan security forces have the capacity to sufficiently fight and defend their country. I want to emphasize repeatedly, and I've said that before, a negative outcome, a Taliban automatic military takeover is not a foregone conclusion. So this guy could not have been more disastrously wrong, but it's not just a matter of being in error, because as you poke around and look into this Afghan situation, you realize that these are people who knew that things were going badly They even said they were going badly, but they were always cooking the books. They were always trying to come up with metrics. And think about it. When you when you are looking for metrics, you can always find something and you say, look, we're doing pretty well over here. This is very reminiscent, by the way, of Vietnam In Vietnam, the uh, U.S. military, again, uh, in order to put the best face on a war that was going badly, would constantly say, oh, thousands of enemy soldiers killed, thousands of um, casualties on the other side. These numbers were constantly massaged and cooked and in some cases outright made up. And the same is going on in Afghanistan. The Washington Post, by the way, did a series. Now, this is, goes back to 2019. They were probably doing it to go after Trump. But nevertheless, it's called At War With The Truth. And I'm just going to read this up. But U.S. officials constantly said they were making progress. They were not, and they knew it. So this is the point. And we're talking here about military officials, but we're also talking about State Department officials, Defense Department officials. And we're talking about media collaborating with those with those lies. Let me focus in a little bit on Millie, because here's a guy who recognized that there was a rapidly deteriorating situation in Afghanistan. How do I know this? Because he did. Uh, It's discussed. uh, Milley's uh, uh, own views are discussed um, in an inspector general report to Congress submitted in July. And in that report, Milley is quoted as saying that the Taliban, this is from June, controlled about 81 districts in Afghanistan. One month later, 
According to Milley, the Taliban controls 419 districts, a rapid increase. So the Taliban is essentially sweeping the outskirts of the country, leaving only Kabul in the control of the Afghan army with help from the United States. Now, while Milley knows that there is a serious crisis in Afghanistan, what is he doing? He's really focused on January 6th. In other words, he's not being a general. He's being a politician masquerading as a general. And so what does he do? Uh, he shows up uh, and he says, oh, I'm, uh, I'm trying to understand white rage. First of all, he should be understanding Taliban rage. He should be focused on, what, on the job of a general, which is to win our wars. Instead, this buffoon, this costume clown is showing up before Congress, talking about his own psychological inner condition. I mean, who knows what goes through this man's head? You know, what, what would life be like if I wore high heels tomorrow? Uh, you know, what if I had a transgender surgery? Would I be a better general? So this kind of nonsense sense is it's a substitute for war making. Now, this may seem like a, um, a kind of uh, one-time deviation from Millie, but that's not the case. I think actually, if you look more closely, you see that if you go back to the Trump era, uh, Millie was actually a major force uh, undermining the constitutional authority of Trump. When Trump was talking about invoking the Insurrectionary Act, and let's remember the Insurrection Act, remember this was when there was a real insurrection going on. Tens of thousands of people in major cities, including Washington, D.C., rioting, burning things. There were some murders that went on. And Trump is like, do we need the military? And, and Milley saw it as his task to block Trump and to block the commander in chief. Think about it. We have we live in a system which has civilian control of the military. But Milley saw his task as, in a sense, keeping the president in check, making the president do his bidding rather than the other way around. So... Here is a guy, I think, dishonest to the core, uh, someone who, and he's not the only one, is looking out for his career move. Who's the one who's going to have a say over my next move? Will I get another star? Will I have a comfortable retirement? Can I move on to the board of the Raytheon Corporation? Uh, so in other words, these are careerist types uh, who uh, are deserving of major public distrust. I mean, to some degree, when I, when I put together all the things this guy done, I think the guy needs to be court-martialed. Of course, he's not going to be court-martialed. He needs to be fired. Of course, he's not going to be fired. He needs to resign. He's not going to resign. But this is the fate that, even if it doesn't come his way, is the one he richly deserves. You know, it was really fun for me to see Mike Lindell at the Trump rally. This guy has such a passion for his beliefs, and he has a passion to help everyone get the best sleep of your life. Now, he didn't just stop by creating the best pillow. He's also created the new Giza Dream bed sheets, and these look and feel great, which means an even better night's sleep for me, which is crucial for my busy schedule. Mike found the world's best cotton called Giza. It's ultra soft and breathable, but also extremely durable. Mike's Giza Dream sheets come with a 60-day money-back guarantee and a 10-year warranty. The first night you sleep on these sheets, that's it. You're never going to want to sleep on anything else. The Giza Dream sheets come in a variety of sizes and colors, and Mike is making a special offer for my listeners sale of the year for a limited time, 50% off as low as $49.99 on the sheets. Go to MyPillow.com and use promo code Dinesh. There you'll find not just this offer, but deep discounts on all MyPillow products. You got to fill your home with the MyPillow stuff like Debbie and I have. Now call 800-876-0227 and use promo code Dinesh, or you can just go to MyPillow.com. But to get the discount, you got to use promo code D-I-N-E-S-H Dinesh. One of the um, aftermaths of war is refugees. Uh, apparently, there have been some news reports that the United States has worked over the past several years with 300,000 Afghans in some capacity or the other, translators, teachers. And now the question is, are we going to be seeing all these people in the United States? Is Here come the Afghans. Uh, that is a question, and I must say a little bit of a um, terrifying question, because not only is our southern border open, but are we now going to take, what, tens if not hundreds of thousands of Muslims from a remote country that is undeveloped, a third world tribal part of the world, and what, plunk them into Milwaukee and Los Angeles and Philadelphia What's that going to do for the United States? So I thought to be interesting, you and I were talking about this, uh, Debbie, 
um, this morning, and uh, we were. Well, you said you're very troubled, or you're you don't like the idea of importing this vast horde of refugees. Now, why is that? Well, first of all, you have to look at the Afghan people themselves. Are they able to function in a society such as ours, a modern society, uh, without imposing their barbaric, in some instances, views uh, of women, uh, even in general? I'm not even talking about the Taliban. I'm talking about just in general, right? Um, are we going to be okay with it? I personally am a little frightened about of it. I mean, these are guys, let's just be honest. When we go back even to the beginning of the Afghan situation, you know, they're playing polo on horseback with animal heads. And so this is a, a totally different set of cultures. Now, when young people go to college, they hear multiculturalism, all cultures are equal. It's only when you go around the world that you realize, wait a minute, you know, all well, cultures are not only not they, equal, but many of them are indigestible. They're not the same. Cultures they're, are not the same, obviously. And, and there are some cultures that are resistant to that melting pot, right? Yeah. They don't want to melt. They want to continue their ways. And what I'm asking is, are there, are there ways compatible with our ways? I don't think so. Now, you have, uh, in fairness, you have in Afghanistan, and I think this is true of the Muslim world generally, you do have the radical Muslims, and obviously we put the Taliban in that category. But you do have these Muslims, and we do know two things about them. I mean, one thing we know about them is that they want what the what America was trying to do over there. So however quixotic on or kind of far-fetched our goal was, these are people who do want their daughters to be educated. These are people who were. And the other thing is that they must be to some degree pro-American. Why else would they work with America? Think of it as a foreign country in their country. The Taliban is appealing to anti-Americanism. Look at the foreign invader. And yet these are guys who were willing to help us. So do you think we owe them an obligation? And if we don't discharge it this way, uh, what kind of what message does it send to other people around the world about helping us, which is like, wow, the Americans take advantage of us. They work with us when they need us. And then when they take off, goodbye, farewell. We'll see you next time. Well, it doesn't mean just because people help the homeless doesn't mean that you're going to open your house to them. Right. I mean, I, I equate that to something similar. Uh, perhaps going to a different country, not this country, but one that is a little bit closer in culture and religion to that country, perhaps doing that. I mean, one interesting thing is that I noticed that, first of all, look how other countries are very careful to protect their own self-interest. India, for example, which has a kind of very pro-Hindu regime under Modi. And here's a headline. India says it will prioritize Hindus and Sikhs in issuing emergency visas. So they're not like, come one, come all. They're like, we're going to pick the guys that we want in our country and everybody else can stay out. Uh, I know that Emmanuel Macron in France issued a very kind of negative statement in effect saying, you know, thank you very much. You know, we wish you well, but we're not looking forward to seeing all of you on the Champs-Élysées, so to speak. Uh, this is my uh, my paraphrase of what he's saying. Now, um, so, so I'm not sure, and I'm not sure the other Muslim countries are going to be too excited about taking the Afghans uh, either. So their view seems to be it's America's obligation. You're, you were the guys in Afghanistan. You worked with these people. They're not our problem. They're your problem. Well, <laughs> I, I, I have a little bit of that sentiment, I think, towards, towards them. Now, people are, people are going to say, now, Debbie, uh, you know, you've talked about, I've talked about my cousin on, a, on many occasions, and, and I want him to come to America as a refugee, because the political system in, in Venezuela is such that if you are a dissident, you could be murdered, you could be incarcerated for life. And so I feel like the situation in Venezuela is dire, and I would love for him to come to America. And, but he's, you know, he's a mechanical engineer, so he's, he's Catholic. And so I feel like relig his religion and even his, his schooling would, would blend in nicely with, with America. But no. I, don't feel that, I don't feel that about these people. Now, our refugee laws are very much focused on the fact that, number one, 
um, we don't take refugees just because you're poor, right? Because otherwise, right. two thirds of the we world the would be here. here. Yeah. So yeah. the refugee laws are basically on the idea that if you live in a tyrannical regime that is persecuting and oppressing you, now that does. That is the case here. You have the Taliban. We know their record. Some of them are making a little bit of uh, friendly noises like, you know, we were, we're, we're not going to take the same dark view of women as we used to and so on. But the truth of it is they're very clear that rights for women are, quote, within the limits of Islam. They're very clear that's what they're going to do. So my point is these people would seem to qualify under refugee status. And then you add to the fact that these are people who have been helping us. Uh, I mean, normal refugees don't, right? You have people who are fleeing other countries. We don't owe them anything. We can, out of generosity, take them in. But these are guys we have, in fact, been working with. So my question is, uh, even among the lo- the large number of people we work with, I assume that there are distinctions to be made. There are some people who have, we've worked with closely. We feel like we have some sort of a debt to them. Now, I do want to be clear. When I say we, I actually don't mean you and me. I'm talking about because we didn't make these decisions, right? Right. These were decisions that were made on our behalf and on behalf of our country um, by people who now love the phrase we. We owe them this. We owe them that. It's like, well, why don't you open your home to them? You're the one who had these pol- these kind of warmongering policies for 20 years. Right. Um, so you're saying we made our bed? Well, I'm saying I'm saying we we, we inherit the debris of our own bad judgment. Right. Maybe maybe it's a lesson to doing that again. Right. Somewhere else. When we come back, I want to talk about um, whether or not um, these refugees coming from very distant and alien cultures might, in fact, be a moral improvement for this country. When's the last time you looked at your mortgage? I mean, really looked at what you're spending. If it's been a while, you could be overpaying and not even know it. It's true. The interest rates we're seeing now are still incredibly low, and they include options in the twos, which could mean hundreds of dollars in monthly savings, just waiting for you to take advantage of. So do yourself a favor and make a 10-minute call to American Financing. Get that free mortgage review and see if their salary-based mortgage consultants can save you up to $1,000 a month. No pressure, no upfront or hidden fees. Call 888-528-1219. That's 888-528-1219 or visit AmericanFinancing.net. American Financing, NMLS 182334, NMLSConsumerAccess.org. I'm back with Debbie. We're talking about Afghan refugees in large numbers and um, and are we going to take them and should we take them? Here's a uh, tweet by a guy named Zaid Jalani. And he's uh, responding to Steve Cortez. Now, Steve Cortez goes, the very last thing America needs right now is a swarm of migrants from a battle-torn wasteland. But this Jelani goes, wait a minute. He goes, you're supposed to be conservatives. These are family-oriented people. Uh, They may be tribal, but they're hardworking. They love the United States. And then I think something that I found very interesting, he goes on to say, these people may come from primitive cultures, but they're very unspoiled. Now, in fairness, you and I were you and I were looking at a little social media clip this morning and you know, you basically have this boy, he's like 23 years old. He's wearing a dress and he goes he goes, "I want to talk about the fact that I'm gender fair." F A E R, gender fair, which I guess is that you're non-binary, you're not male or female, but you sort of lean to the feminine side. And then yeah. he goes, uh, "We want to distinguish gender fair from gender floor, which is non-binary but leaning to the masculine side." My point is, look at what we've created in the United States. So when we say, you know, we want to st- set up a high standard, these immigrants don't meet it, or these migrants don't meet it. My question is, are we better off with some? you know, some Afghan family that's going to start from the ground up. If we look at what's happened with Cuban families, Venezuelan families, Eastern European families. But that's a completely different culture. The the Catholic Hispanic culture is completely different than these people that come from the 11th century Muslims. They are. They are. You can't compare the two. Yeah, but we do have, I mean, we have Muslims in America. In fact, I, I understand that Muslims very voted. Very Western, though. Very yeah. Western, very modern. They're, right. They don't, you know, they don't dress like the 11th century. You know, you saw that photo of the Taliban and in the background, the, the photo of that um, uh, 
teacher, you know, on the rock. From and, the beginning from of the Islam. Beginning of, and, and they're all dressed exactly the same. I mean, how scary is that? These people come come here to America, and do you really think they're going to go to Macy's and, and buy clothing there, you know? Well, I mean, historically, I'm just saying, I don't you know, know, there are immigrants historically who have come to America, admittedly from Europe, but speaking German or yeah, spe- know, but... not speaking a word of English. And it sometimes takes a generation or so for them to assimilate. I think the question to me is not even so much can we assimilate them because the truth of it is we do assimilate them. But my question is assimilate them to what? In other words, think of what, think of the difference between say you and me on the one side and Ilhan Omar on the other, right? She is assimilated to a left-wing anti-American culture. What happens though if these guys do the same thing? Because, well, that's the question. Because perhaps they see conservatives, Republicans, as not wanting them here. And the the left Democrats do, but not for the reasons that we might think, but rather, oh, more votes. What if they see the, them as their friend and they start voting for this guy that thinks he's not a person? I mean, that he's like a an asexual, he's a gender, gender free fair. person, right? So they, in a sense, by by protecting or not not protecting, but by voting for Democrats are going to be protecting these people. By well, default. This, this is the point. I mean, if but what I'm saying is that if the unified I mean, conservative view is don't take the Afghans, right? Mm-hmm. And then the political reality is, and we don't have a say in this because the Biden people are going to decide this, they do take the Afghans, then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because the Afghans come here. And even though they might be more... Uh, emotionally inclined to a party of upward mobility, more inclined toward associating with people who have moral values and a moral anchor, are more traditional in their way of life. Nevertheless, they go, those people don't really want us here. Those people are trying to kick us out. Therefore, let's go to this other party. Yeah, there's some weirdos over there. But on the other hand, they seem to be far more welcoming. Well, and I'm afraid some of my Venezuelan friends um, take the same view. You know, because as you know, the reason that they're leaving Venezuela or Cuba is because they don't want to be a socialist or communist country. And so they're coming here and they're voting for the party that embraces that ideology. So in a way, they are voting for the exact same thing that they left the country, that country behind. I don't know about the Afghans coming here and voting for that type of lifestyle, because obviously nobody subscribes to that. But they may come here and embrace a Moulin Rouge way of life because those were the people that had their arms wide open for them. Now, you were watching this uh, photo of these, I don't know, 800 Afghans. Oh. I, I, interestingly, there were, it was, wasn't so much women and kids. It was all young men. Well, there were a few, there were a few women and babies. But like, they were pressed the... together. Oh. What And you were like... Risk- As you know, because I'm such a germaphobe and because I do believe that this virus is real and horrible, I'm like, oh my goodness, they're not wearing masks. They're in, like, literally, I think they said it was 640 people, all jammed in this one airplane. And I'm just thinking, okay, they're bringing COVID. That's That's all I'm seeing. But then, on the other hand, I'm also seeing, oh my goodness, I bet they didn't have to take their shoes off. In fact, <laughs> they didn't have to do anything, really. They just climbed on that airplane and got in, and and there they go. I mean, I think about it. To the degree that you're screening oh. for people who might pose a danger. Oh, my goodness. I mean, goodness. here you're picking up people oh right off the... Think goodness. of it. When you, right off the street in Kabul, I'm not sure the United States has a systematic way to distinguish how, how friend you know? from foe. How exactly. do you know? Exactly. How do you know if, if some of these guys didn't get in and they're terrorists? What's your name? Abdul Abdul. Oh, wait oh. a minute. There was an Abdul Abdul who worked for us the other day. Are you the same guy? Yeah. No, no. he's my brother. <laughs> exactly. No, but it's so dangerous. Dangerous. And so so what I see is I just see complete and utter hypocrisy on the left, because obviously because of 9-11, um, we all have to be inconvenienced at airports. We have to go through this scanner machine Then who knows how much radiation we get, you know, every time we go on there. Uh, we have to take off our shoes. We have to like dispose of our liquids, all those things. And, and I see all these people and they probably did none of it, none of it. Not to mention all this talk about COVID and masks and all of this. And and look at them. 
I mean, they're bringing this into our country. And, and I don't even think that they have a way of testing these people for COVID. A- and I heard that they are actually asking airlines to transport them to all parts of the country. So here we go. I mean, it shows that our leaders are asking one thing of citizens and they quickly forget about those requirements. In fact, they don't even care about them, not just for themselves when they have their own parties. Out the window. But the when, window. It, when they're dealing with the southern border, the Afghans, somehow the rules don't apply. If you choose to believe search engines like Google, then all you need to do to surf the internet privately is turn on incognito mode in your browser. And we're supposed to trust big tech with solutions to our online privacy, right? Well, wrong. It doesn't matter what browser mode you use or how often you clear your browsing history, your internet service provider can see every website you've ever visited and they can even sell your data to advertisers. That's why I use ExpressVPN to keep my online data secure and private. ExpressVPN makes sure your internet service provider and third-party trackers can't see your online activity and location. It does that by rerouting your connection through a secure encrypted server. ExpressVPN has you covered with easy to use apps for computers and mobile devices. And all you have to do is tap one button and boom, you're protected. Protect your online activity today with the VPN that I trust to keep me private. Visit expressvpn.com slash Dinesh. You'll get an extra three months free on a one-year package. Again, that's expressvpn.com slash Dinesh. In this bleak environment, it's always good to have a nice win. And we have one here in Texas. Uh, looks like we're going to have voter integrity laws. We're going to have laws that restrict um, critical race theory. We're going to have laws that tighten the noose on abortion. And the reason we're going to have all that is because a whole bunch of the Texas Democrats are back in Texas. Now, uh, three of them are not only back in the state, uh, but they are back in the legislature. And they're trying to put a brave face on it, but essentially they are admitting defeat. They don't like to put it that way. So I'm now quoting uh, one of them. It says, uh, we, we took the fight for voting rights to Washington. And uh, they go, now we continue the fight on the House floor. Well, there's not going to be a whole lot of fight on the House floor because the Republicans have a pretty decisive majority in both houses. They've already passed, by the way, the voter integrity uh, in the Senate. So it only remains to be passed in the House. And it looks like that's going to happen pretty quickly. Now, you know which side is losing by where the infighting is going on. And sure enough, a whole bunch of Democrats, some of them from out of state, are screaming, what happened? Where, wh- why why these Texas Democrats go home? They didn't even tell us. So this is, this is funny stuff. The Texas Democrats had apparently been making the case on a Zoom call that they were having regularly. And a bunch of them were like, listen, enough of this. You know, we need to get back. We are, after all, part of a democratic process. We are, after all, accountable to our constituents. And um, and uh, I guess at some point they decided, listen, there's enough of this kind of discussion. We're just going to get on a plane and go back. And so um, these Democrats, the um the come home Democrats are being um, vilified. Uh, here's Representative Donna Howard. She goes, this could have been shared with caucus members beforehand. <laughs> you didn't tell us. Uh, Representative Ana Maria Ramos goes, uh, guess what the defecting Democrats have accomplished by going back? And then in all caps, nothing. <laughs> in other words, they were hoping to keep this going a little bit longer. But um, the um, no, it's... Um, they they were not able to convince they had their meetings the texas democrats with kamala harris with leading members of congress supposedly they were trying to use their amazing persuasive powers to convince congress to pass hr1 uh, hr1 is in serious trouble uh, i won't say it's dead in the water uh, but it certainly wasn't advanced 1 inch by the texas democrats no they had a meeting with manchin they was you know i think manchin was sort of gave them a courtesy meeting and then was sort of chuckling afterward but nevertheless Uh, They're now in Texas and we're going to get a voter integrity law. And what does it do? Well, it does all the good things that make cheating more difficult. Number one, video surveillance of drop boxes. Number two, restrictions on how much campaigning can go on while you're waiting in line to vote. 
Number three, there's more time for early voting, but none of this 24 hour voting, none of this, none of the fishy stuff that can happen in the middle of the night with the drop boxes. Number four, criminal penalties for sending unsolicited ballot request forms. In other words, no mass mailing of ballots, um, of mail in ballots in a way where it becomes very difficult to know who filled it out, who sent it in, and so on. So what's going on is there is an effort here to, I'd say, lock the barn door. And maybe the horse got out one time, but it looks like at least in Texas there's a recognition that we got to straighten this process out. We've got to perhaps not eliminate cheating, but make it very difficult to cheat. Uh, this is why the Texas Democrats were alarmed. Oh, whoa, they're making it more difficult to cheat. Let's get out of here. But they're now back. Uh, and like it or not, they're going to have to compete on a level playing field um, in a state that does want to have voter integrity. And now, finally, it will. I just got a call from Dr. Howard, the founder of Balance of Nature. He's calling from Germany. He's like, how are you and Debbie doing? I mean, what a sweet guy to even think about us. Here's a guy who told us that we are a long way from being healthy if we aren't eating enough fruits and veggies in our diet. So he told us, try Balance of Nature. Just see how it makes you feel. It turns out, not only do we feel like we are in our 20s, and hey, we have kids in their 20s, but we know we're getting what we need. We take 10 daily servings of fruits and veggies, all in six small capsules. So here are the bottles. They're just the fruits and the veggies. They're absolutely no trouble to swallow, always fresh, nothing artificial. They smell great. And Debbie swears by this, the fiber and spice. She says that she's never been more regular. Invest in your health, invest in your life. Join me and experience the balance of nature difference for yourself for years to come. For a limited time, all new preferred customers get an additional 35% discount and free shipping on your first Balance of Nature order. Use discount code AMERICA. Call 800-246-8751 or go to balanceofnature.com and use discount code AMERICA. I'm really happy to welcome uh, Jenna Ellis, my buddy, back to the uh, podcast. Um, Jenna is former Trump attorney, and she's also um, starting a new podcast with the Salem Podcast Network. This uh, podcast, mine, is part of the Salem Podcast Network. So this is wonderful, Jenna. Kind of welcome to the team. Uh, by the way, you can you can go to SalemPodcastNetwork.com and subscribe to Jenna's upcoming show now. Um, Jenna, um, you told me that you are at Disney World. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you yes. doing? What are you doing there? I, I am. I am escaping reality right now. It's better to be in fantasy land than in Joe Biden's America right now. So I had to come just for the weekend to get a little bit of magic. Come to Florida, which is uh, the freest state right now in all of America. It's great that Ron DeSantis is doing such a good job. So um, I think for all of us, sometimes we just need to escape politics. But happy to come on, Dinesh, of course, and uh, had to do that from Disney World State. But I found hopefully a background that's not to, you know, Mickey Minnie. <laughs> Not at all. Not, well, let me ask you this. There's so much going on. Um, I mean, Biden is producing disaster, as it seems, on every front, right? He's got he's got the border crisis going, and then he's got all this extravagant spending that he's pushing on one side. And, and then we've got the Afghan disaster. I mean, it's it seems hard that he could achieve so much catastrophe in a few months. So, you know, when we think back to Jimmy Carter, he was a complete nincompoop. But of course, his disasters were spread out over four years. Um, talk about what do you think is the, if you had to name the single most most alarming and disturbing thing that Biden has done with maybe the longest term consequences, what would that be and why? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think um, overall, his absolute abuse for executive power is going to have the longest term consequences. When he is clearly flouting the rule of law, he's not staying within the margins of the Constitution um, openly and willingly, then that shows that he's not willing to actually be the commander in chief of the United States of America. He's just a tyrant. And tyrants, of course, will have arbitrary uh, and, and completely capricious decisions 
decisions. That that's what we've seen with the disaster that's going on in Afghanistan. That's what we're seeing now uh, with these vaccine mandates. Uh, that he's even contemplating that at the federal level. There are so many different abuses that if he is not reined in by the Supreme Court and by federal courts to say no, we don't have a tyrant in the United States of America. That will have the longest term precedential consequence. Let's talk for a moment about the vaccine mandate. I mean, I support vaccines, but I don't support vaccine mandates. Here's my question. Uh, you're a lawyer, Harvard Law School, Jenna. Where is the authority in the Constitution for the president or the executive branch to impose a vaccine mandate? Is there one? Yeah, well, and proud University of Richmond School of Law, actually. So, <laughs> so just have to give them a shout out. But uh, no, there's absolutely no powers uh, in the U.S. Constitution that's provided to the federal government. Uh, the government not only is a, a separation of powers, which is how we make sure to check tyranny, but also specific enumerated powers. We have the Ninth and Tenth Amendment for a reason, which says that all powers that are not expressly given to the federal government are reserved to the states or to we the people. And so there is nothing whatsoever within uh, the U.S. Constitution that provides Congress or uh, the, the chief executive or the executive branch to do anything like these types of vaccine mandates. That's why President Trump was so very clear that he would provide resources, recommendations, and supports to the states so that the government that is closest to us, that we can control best, that we can participate in best, they're the ones that actually have the authority, if they even do under the state constitutions, to implement some health and safety regulation. I do believe under any theory for for any branch of government, uh, that type of vaccine mandate is too coercive. It's unconstitutional for a variety of reasons. And I do think the analysis changes after today when the FDA uh, ultimately has approved at least the, at least to the Pfizer vaccine. I think there are still some very good arguments that we have to, as individuals, have the ability to refuse under a theory of informed consent. And we also can't be compelled by our government, uh, whether or not there's a small punitive sanction, you know, that may be OK, but a government should never be able to coerce someone to take a vaccine. When we come back, I want to ask Jenna Ellis about some other, let's call them zones of lawlessness, the treatment of January 6 protesters, but also what's happening uh, on the southern border. We'll be right back. In their recent budget proposal, the White House Budget Office forecast inflation for 2021 at 2.1%. Now, in June, the actual rate, 5.4%. The point inflation is here. It's coming faster than our government is prepared for. And their solution is to stick their heads in the sand. Now, don't stick your head in the sand. Hedge your savings against inflation by diversifying into gold and silver with Birch Gold Group. Now, if you haven't reached out to Birch Gold to diversify a part of your IRA or 401k into a precious metals IRA, do it today. I buy my gold from Birch Gold. They have an A-plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, countless five-star reviews, and thousands of happy customers. Talk to them. Have them help you safeguard your investments. Text Dinesh to 484848 to claim your free information kit and to speak with a precious metals expert on holding gold and silver in a tax-sheltered account. Again, text Dinesh to 484848 and protect your savings today. I'm back with Jenna Ellis, uh, former Trump attorney and um, newly inaugurated Salem podcaster. Her podcast begins September 13th, but you can sign up now at SalemPodcastNetwork.com. Jenna, we're talking about the sort of rampant lawlessness of the Biden administration. I want to talk about what's happening with the January 6th protesters, because very interestingly, I saw just a day or so ago that the FBI now discloses that this was not, in fact, a coordinated attack. Presumably, it would have to be to qualify as a coup or an insurrection. There's no such thing as 10 guys independently launching individual coups. Now, but, but on the one hand, I'm tempted to say, wow, they finally get the message. But a part of me says, I wonder why the FBI is making this disclosure. Could it be that the FBI itself had an inordinate role in orchestrating these attacks, just as it had a very big role in the, the uh, Whitmer kidnapping scheme? And could it be that the FBI wants to shut down and attempt to connect the dots so people don't go was this really something that you incited? Was this an insurrection really led by the Federal Bureau of Investigation? 
I think those are all very reasonable questions. And the American people deserve to know the truth. They, they deserve to know what was, if any, the FBI's role. Um, I think that the last five years with President Trump has caused a lot of undermining of our trust in government institutions, that they're telling us the truth, that they're being transparent. The fact that we uh, don't have any sort of disclosure about anything that happened with Ashley Babbitt um, is just remarkably a lack of, of transparency in the FBI and all of these invest, investigative um, regulatory agencies that frankly work for us and they are supposed to do the business of justice. What we're seeing here is that there is no justice. There is no truth seeking. There's only an agenda and it's a political one at best. And so when you look at the political prisoners that, be, that are being held without bail and many of these people are either being far vastly overcharged or they're being held on a simple misdemeanor. It's the Democrats who have screamed for a long time about bail reform. And yet when it comes to a political controversy that fits within their narrative, they're certainly more than happy to say, oh, these quote unquote insurrectionists need to be held without bail. And again, this is a failure ultimately of the judicial branch. And it's up to the branch that is supposed to be the non-political branch to make sure to hold the others accountable. I mean, if we can talk for a moment about Ashley Babbitt, the contrast between her case, uh, which is to say uh, a, a citizen who's shot by a police officer. Uh, and, and I understand that there's a fairly well-established standard for when that can be done. The person, for example, has to pose an imminent threat to you, to the police officer, which was manifestly not the case here. There were a number of other guards, well-armed. The woman was a distance away. She hadn't even really come through the barrier. She was unarmed. She's not exactly a very large person. It's hard to see how this officer faced any threat to his own life, let alone to the people immediately around him. There seems to have been absolutely no clear warning given to her. Hey, you know, don't come forward. I'm going to shoot. None of that. So given all these facts, it is really incredible to me that there's a, just a blanket. We've cleared the guy. Nothing to see here, folks. Move along. And that's all we've got so far. Oh, contrast to that, Dinesh, between the treatment of Derek Chauvin and the George Floyd case and how that was so politically motivated. And obviously, you know, what happened there is ultimately a tragedy, but so is what happened to Ashley Babbitt. And that's why the rule of law needs to be non-political. We need to apply the same standards to every police officer, regardless of whether they're male or female or whether uh, the deceased is a black or white man or woman, Trump supporter or not, regardless of any of those politically biased facts. That's why the rule of law has to be upheld and why I think so many Americans see the hypocrisy. And that's what we're so frustrated about is that double standard that the mainstream media just completely ignores and that ultimately our justice system is now just a political system. And that is the tipping point of failure. And, and we turn into a totalitarian society when we can't count on true, meaningful justice, because then we won't have true, meaningful liberty for all. Let me ask you one final question, Jenna, about the border. And that is that it's very clear that what the Biden people are doing by sort of letting the applicants into the United States to dissolve into the population. They're even dissipating them all over the country. It's very clear that this is a kind of obvious attempt to circumvent the immigration laws. Hey, show up for your court data, but if you don't show up, we'll understand. My question is, why haven't judges jumped up and down and, go and said, in effect, listen, you don't get to dodge the law in this way. It appears that there's been some judicial acquiescence in what the Biden people have been doing on the border. Why is that. Yeah, and it's not just acquiescence, it's absolute activism. And and again, this is a failure of the judicial branch and we've seen that the judicial branch has been the failure to keep those political branches in check. And this is another reason why the Biden administration is just so clearly flouting the law because they won't be held accountable. I mean, it's no different than any participant in any sort of, you know, game, sporting event, um, business anything, if they know that the rules won't be enforced, then of course they're just going to do whatever they want because they recognize that they're not going to be held accountable. And this is why it's really frustrating that the RNC um, and the Federalist Society and even the wonderful judges that President Trump ultimately appointed, I think are more rhino based um, and they're not going to be as originalist and as conservative as we would prefer. But I'm hoping that ultimately the Supreme Court uh, will end up stepping in. 
And, and I hope also that when we have uh, the House back in 2022, we need to make sure that Biden is impeached and held to the constitutional standard that we as, Amer as Americans can expect from our leader. Jenna, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Love to have you back soon. Sounds good. Thanks, friend. Mike Lindell has a new product, the MyPillow Quilt, and we just ordered these new MyPillow Quilts to go with our Giza Dream Sheets, and the verdict is in. We absolutely love them. They're just the right weight and warmth, and they come in a variety of colors. So don't wait. Order now and save 30% off the new MyPillow Quilts by calling 800-876-0227 or go to MyPillow.com. But to get the discount, you got to use promo code Dinesh. Shakespeare's Othello is a play that points to some of the perils, the limitations, and maybe even the danger of what we now call diversity. The play focuses on a man who is an outsider to Venetian society on two counts. First, uh, he is a dark-skinned man, a, a black man, a moor, but being a Moor, he is more um, than someone who is racially or, or perhaps in terms of his color different. He's also different in his original religion. The Moors were Muslims and the Muslims had uh, conquered um, uh, large parts of Europe and in fact posed, even at the time of the play, a terrible threat to Venice. Uh, the Turks are attacking Venice when the play begins. Now, Othello on this count has moved over. He is a convert to Christianity, and he is a mercenary who is fighting on behalf of Venice against the Turks. But you can imagine that when you have a Muslim, we can think of this now with the Afghan situation, who has come over to your side, they don't get fully trusted because the Venetians still think, is he really on our side or not? Is he pretending to be on our side? Is he some kind of a double agent? So there is a certain kind of insecurity that surrounds Othello that I think is the key to this, this play. Now, in many of the um, Shakespearean tragedies, something horrific happens at the beginning. Um, in Hamlet, for example, what happens is the murder of the king. And that happens even before the play begins. In Macbeth, early on, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth together conspire to kill Duncan, the king. So there is a horrific act of murder, again, right up front uh, in the play. But in Othello, no. In Othello, there is a kind of unfolding of events and um, the murder the horrific and unnecessary murder of Desdemona by Othello occurs only at the very end by a kind of chain of almost um, disturbing inevitability. Now, um, Othello, in that sense, begins as a man of tremendous repute. He's a, he's a famous, he's kind of a war hero in Venice. Uh, and this gives him a certain prestige, although I say a little bit of a dubious prestige in Venetian society. But at the end, he returns to the sort of barbarism that was always suspected of people who came, quote, from darkest Africa or people who came from the bowels of the Muslim world. Uh, he does this murder that is so disgusting and so um, unnerving that it's difficult to watch. And you feel not even that tragic sense of fulfillment that you sometimes have when you're watching a, uh, when you're watching, for example, the um, uh, Oedipus Rex. Uh, here you just have a sense of being degraded at the end. There are just bodies all over the stage and essentially the mood is just take the bodies away. We can't look at this. Now, um, Aristotle says that in Greek uh, tragedy, um, it, it, the story is often about a great man or a man who is great in many respects who nevertheless has a tragic flaw. This flaw in Greek is called hamartia. It doesn't necessarily mean a tragic flaw. It can mean a mistake, an error of judgment. But nevertheless, that seems to fit Othello. You've got a man of undoubted stature. You've got somebody who is um, well regarded for the most part in society. But nevertheless, he has this flaw. This flaw, by the way, is widely believed to be just jealousy. But what makes this matter complicated is the fact that 
You can be jealous. Yeah, you think your wife is having an affair. But first of all, the evidence for that in the play is kind of limited. It's obviously manipulated by the villain of the play. His name is Iago. But nevertheless, it's all based on a handkerchief. Uh, and there are other ways to read that evidence. But Othello jumps to the one way that suggests, oh, yeah, my wife is obviously unfaithful and I've got to be the avenging angel of justice, if you will, or vengeance uh, because of this uh, appropriation, you may say, of what is mine. But uh, obviously, there are people who could be in the same situation who would respond differently. So the question is, why does Othello respond in this way? I think the answer to that has to do with the fact that there's a very strange relationship between Othello and Desdemona. Uh, the first question you have to ask is, what do they see in each other? First of all, what does Desdemona see in Othello? It may seem that she's uh, attracted to him. Um, you know, he's a very handsome man, except no, Othello himself says more than once in the play that he's extremely ugly. And he says this is not what, in what attracted Desdemona to him at all. Rather, it seems, what Desdemona found appealing about Othello is you could almost call it the multicultural impulse. Here is a beautiful and rich and well-born, but nevertheless provincial girl who meets this stranger from a distant country. And Othello himself says, I, I told her wonderful stories about wars and conquests and sufferings that I had in, in faraway places. And Desdemona's entranced and she sort of is like, wow. It's kind of like, you know, this sense that the other, the outsider is somehow exotic and therefore appealing. So Desdemona is kind of a native, a local who wants to be a cosmopolitan. For Othello, his attraction to her is the exact opposite. He is a cosmopolitan who wants to be a native. And what I mean by that is that he is a man of many travels who nevertheless wants to be accepted as a full citizen of Venice. But that's not easy to do. Uh, as I say, even his military affiliation is mistrusted. But Othello thinks, if I marry into one of the best families of Venice, if I marry this young girl from a patrician household, it will help me be fully accepted in this new country. So this is, we could almost call it immigrant insecurity, the desire to be fully a part. Debbie's kind of chuckling. She goes, Dinesh, uh, uh, fully accepted in this uh, new society. Now, Ironically, neither Othello nor Desdemona, both of whom in some ways are quite self-confident, um, uh, to think of themselves, I think both of them do, more Othello even, as an independent person, not in a sense captive or not dependent on anyone else. But Iago, who's the villain of the play, who's the clearest thinker of the play, recognizes that this is actually not true. Oth Othello is fatally dependent, not just upon the idea that he loves Desdemona, but that she loves him. And so what he does is he's able to play on that, play on that insecurity, if you will, the insecurity of the outsider. And it is that that brings about Othello's unhappy end. So the lesson, I think, from Shakespeare is that it's not so easy for outsiders to become full members of a society. And moreover, the appeal of the outsider is in some ways a little bit unhealthy. It's a little unhealthy because it can cause the formation of alliances that are not necessarily anchored uh, in rational considerations, but create bonds of psychological dependency that in this case are ruthlessly exploited by a bad guy, Iago, to bring about for Othello and for Desdemona a very bad end. Subscribe to the Dinesh D'Souza podcast on Apple, Google, and Spotify, or watch on Rumble, YouTube, and SalemNow.com.